welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a phenomenal show coming right up with special guest Thomas Hubel, and he's here today to talk to us about modern day mysticism and the Celebrate Life Festival. Thomas is a visionary teacher, innovator, and founder of the pioneering Academy of Inner Science, which promotes the study and the principles of mysticism and human inner development. Today, Thomas is here to discuss with us modern-day mysticism and his upcoming event, Celebrate Life Festival. So let's welcome to the show, Thomas. Oh, thank you for having me, Marianne. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to have you here. And my goodness, you're quite the visionary teacher, I hear. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm happy to be here with you and uh, and, and your audience. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and for a lot of our listeners that might be new to your work, why don't you share a little bit about your journey? Because I found it to be quite fascinating. Yeah, so of course, I mean, <clears throat> yes, it's a it's a bit of an unusual journey, maybe, uh, because like I started off studying medicine in Vienna, and uh, when I was twenty six, I left my studies and I um, went on to a four year meditation retreat, and um, and that was a kind of a very deep time for me. Like I felt that I I had such a strong calling that I I need to let go of what I learned so far and really um, spend some time. I didn't know at the beginning that it's going to be four years, of course, but uh, eventually it turned out to to be that long. And it was a very deep, deep exploration of, let's say, consciousness, my consciousness, human consciousness. And... um, and I really learned a lot in this time. It was like a another studying time. Uh, and so, yeah, eventually after some time, I came out of that retreat, and I still spent almost another year in a in a small flat in an apartment in Vienna, still meditating many hours a day. And um, and then one of my my friends or clients at the time. Um, invited me to see a, another spiritual teacher that came to Vienna. And when the teacher saw me and said some things about me, then um, then people started to invite me to give um, workshops. And so, and then my life suddenly completely changed from being in a very deep inward oriented journey and contemplation, like in many hours a day in a contemplative state and also at the end of these four years, I had a quite a, a profound opening, I would say, or like something profound happened. And then, and then my life changed from one day to the other. And then there were another four years where I just traveled with one with one suitcase and one computer uh, throughout the whole world. And I, I gave a lot of one-on-one sessions. I gave many, many workshops, and so. And then there was another year, another four years of being very, very much out there. And then I got to know my my current wife, and um, and we and we so then we we took an apartment, and then my life changed again. So this was 14 years ago, and and um, and I think all the puzzle pieces in a way came together and and formed the work that I do today. Which is which combines whatever the healing and integration work with the deep spiritual and mystical work with some cultural architecture work, like how do we really bring our spiritual practice into day to day life as parents, as people who affect culture, taking on also some cultural challenges and making a meaning, meaningful contribution. And so a lot of my work is about a, an embodied, grounded, embodied spiritual practice that um, is also innovative and brings new creative solutions into the societal framework while practicing like a deep contemplative practice. I mean, that's I mean, we can go dive into some of the 
aspect steeper, but in order not to make it too long, that that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> that's a short <laughs> version. Well, and it's interesting, you know, how your journey took you from, you know, pr- here you're going to go in the medical field, you're looking at that, and then you do a 180 because a lot of times when people are um, wired so that they are able to do medicine, they have to really see things to have it proven, and yet you took this inward journey. Right, right. And um, and my, my sense is that um, that the inner journey is also a a scientific path, which means that um, that the exploration of human consciousness follows certain inner laws or certain inner processes, and so that's why that's why later on we <clears throat> developed what what we call today the Academy of Inner Science. Um, a um, like an institution where we run worldwide programs and training programs and online programs uh, where we explore how what I call the inner science, like the the contemplative science and outer science, um, the scientific path in different disciplines can meet. Um, and in the meanwhile, we actually established with six universities PhD programs where people take our in-depth programs, like two-year training programs, and and uh, write a PhD uh, on a certain topic um, and combine their inner experience and their scientific background and 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 create PhD works out of it. So exactly what you, what you mentioned, the polarity between outer science and inner science is actually what what i feel i is also one part of my journey to to create a a kind of a dialogue of the mystical voice the inner voice the the contemplative voice and the scientific uh, approach because i believe that the synthesis of both of them uh is is really important and can bring many innovative ideas solutions you know, and, and, um, processes into our cultural process. Well, and I have to applaud you. Not many people would take such extraordinary time to devote to their spiritual practice. And you did that. You know, it seems like you just, you, you knew that's what you were supposed to do and you went with it. Were you ever at a point where you felt conflicted about pursuing your spiritual life? Yes, of course, because I really loved medicine. I mean, I worked for nine years as a volunteer paramedic for the Red Cross. And I, you know, I spent a lot of time in the, in the medical field, and I really loved it. It's, it was very hard for me to leave it. It was not that, oh, I didn't like it anymore. And that's why I left it. This was not the reason. I just felt another very intense calling. And, um, and that's why, um, yes, it, it was not always an easy journey, but somehow I always knew that 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 is what needs to happen. I somehow was clear, like when I felt myself, I felt that that's the right thing. And also now, after many years that I look back, I can I can really see how something carried me or guided me in a way through this four years and um, like some deeper inner knowing that guided me also through the different practices that I did and the choreography of of the four years. Um, so looking back on it, it's, it's, it's kind of, there's a, there's a red thread through the whole time and that's beautiful. And then, and then I think also that the, the power that, that made me do that step is in a way also, in a way, the power that that kind of drives my whole work today. So for me, that was really an important time. It's not something that I I recommend to many people, because that's not everybody's path. And and in fact, for some time, I even hardly spoke about it in depth because I didn't want other people to copy it. Um, because I think we all need to find out what's really our our journey. But for me, it was a very important time, very important study time. 
Well, it seems that you have a very interesting perspective being able to not only have visited all the countries that you did and seeing how different people live in their cultures, but also the spiritual aspect that each culture has and bringing that into the work that you do. Yes. Uh, and in fact, first of all, I met many, many, like, let's say, spiritual leaders in, in, in different cultures and different religions. And and so, I mean, I always, when I when I travel somewhere, I try to, to meet um people or leaders in their own field and have conversations and create collaborations. That's also how we created, for example, the Celebrate Life Festival that we did 14 years in Germany. And, and now it's the first year that uh, it's coming to the U.S. Maybe we're going to talk about this a bit later. But that, that's a, that was a platform where I invited different teachers of different disciplines uh, into dialogues and, and, and presented their work to the audience in Germany. And, and also that... Um, Somehow, also my work in Europe, but then later on in other parts of the world, really helped me to see that that there is one topic that I, I, besides now the deep spiritual part and the individual development work, but what I came to see, what I think is the next big wave in the whole healing field, is that in a way by accident quotation marks i i came across like in the, because it happened in my groups again and again and again like this discharge of collective unconscious material and then i started to get interested in it because it kept repeating itself and then i i came to see the the large the magnitude and the large scale of the col what collective trauma means. I mean, also because I ran many retreats in Germany and in Central Europe, and and very often we came to the Holocaust, to the Second World War, and then it started in the U.S. with, with slavery and uh, Native American genocide, and then whatever in other countries with different topics. But I believe that, and from what I have seen and researched in the last 15 years, that I think that there is a big ghost in the machine and it's called collective trauma and collective trauma that transmits itself uh, throughout the generations. When in fact, last year at the Celebrate Life Festival, I invited a, a professor from a Swiss university as a speaker. She's a professor for epigenetics and, and they already can prove in mice experiments how sperm cells transmit trauma from one generation to the next. And actually, if it's untreated, many generations after show the same symptoms, like the traumatized mice. And, and that, in fact, um, kind of just underlines what I've learned in my groups, that, that there is a dimension of traumatization that is not, in the, not only individual, that is a social trauma, like a collective trauma. And, and, and I believe many questions in the healthcare field, in the social field, in, in many fields actually, um, will find answers by us understanding deeper what most of us have been born into like that collective trauma field that we have been born into. And that's why it's so normal to us because we don't know life any other way. And I think that that has a huge implication that is often outside of the range of our nervous system's capacity to perceive. We, we might know this intellectually, but we might not have a direct experience of what that means. And after many of these collective trauma processes that I have seen. And once we really, as a group, experience the dimension of a collective denial or a collective suppression or a collective unconscious field, I, I, I think my travels also taught me that besides the spiritual, different spiritual paths, but that, that's, that's kind of, that became a passion of mine. We actually, my wife and I, uh, created two years ago, um, after doing this for almost 15 years now, we created a, a global nonprofit that researches and get, get establishes in many countries around the world, um, collective trauma, uh, pockets, we call it the pocket project. And, um, 
because I believe that we have to spark a, a societal conversation and much more research on the topic, scientific research and process research, how, how to work with that. I think, and I also believe that that's going to be the next big wave in the, uh, one of the next big waves in the whole healing and therapy world. Hmm. Yeah. That's very interesting. And I know exactly what you're talking about. There have been times when I've traveled different places and you can feel the energy that is left over at a place from right. whatever trauma that's happened there. And either you feel like you can't breathe or it feels extremely sad or whatever. Right the case is. Right. And so it's interesting to dive into that and look at that more because I think people experience that and then think it's their own stuff and not realize it's collective. That's right. And that that actually a lot of individual suffering actually goes back to like a transgenerational wiring of a collective trauma impact that happened in different cultures. And actually, in fact, if we, if we really uh, like put it into more concrete words like we all are used to the kind of this lovely blues marble or sphere that floats through the universe when we see it from outer space the planet but actually the planet doesn't look really like that when when we look at it closer is that the planet in many parts of the planet has scars well wounds like big wounds like the the second world war is a huge wound through throughout europe and uh, it has many after effects in many generations and it affects the Middle East. So it's kind of an organism that has many scars and we have been born into scar tissue. And I think that's very important that often when we look at individual suffering, that we think, oh, it's our issue. But actually it's, it goes back into a kind of a collective, into a collective field um, and I think also in the in the current trauma work and trauma research research that that the social dimension then when a trauma happens within a, a cultural trauma then the the cultural environment is a very important aspect to consider in the individual healing work and so that's why I think it's a that's a big topic and as you said we can feel it we can we can when we when we pay attention and we are very present we can still feel the remnants or the residues and the the kind of leftovers that that we we feel but it's it's actually in the follow up generations already wired in our bodies in our emotions we get it through kind of I, I'm convinced that through our genetic or epigenetic environment, we get it through our families, our social structures, and that some of the structures that we call normal social structures are actually trauma agreements. And so I think that that's, as you can hear, I'm, I'm kind of passionate mm -hmm. about it because I think there's so much healing and so much awakening and so much, even, even if you just look at uh, climate change, like the the slowness of our response to 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 an immediate uh, issue that we are not facing really as a as a global society, the delay is partly also like trauma. That trauma doesn't want to change. Trauma is scared to change. We cannot push trauma to change. And so when we see in organizations or in in, in societies when we, there is a necessity to change and to kind of shift into new ways of doing things. I believe some of the sand in the engine that we encounter is actually unrecognized trauma that feels like a break in the system. Oh. And um, so I think it's a vital topic and it's it comes up now where climate change and the technology explosion is is um, like two global two global massive change factors come up. And I think that's our global healing process that's that's needed now. Well, it's interesting. I've heard it once described it, you know, a lot of times before there's profound change, we'll have periods of time where things seem to be in utter chaos. And it, I know some people feel like that's how our world is today, but, you know, maybe you can um, just touch on this, but, you know, maybe it's because we're on that cusp of profound change. For sure. And that, that uh, the global external brain, like the World Wide Web, what enables us to have this conversation and, and actually meet from all around the world and, and share like a virtual intimate space 
um, that very technology created kind of even kind of a bigger system around humanity, like an information system that is that is on the one hand amazing because it allows us to do what we do. There's a lot of global learning. There's a much higher speed of data. I mean, the world really benefits on the one hand and on the other hand, there are so many trauma impulses. There's so much information that we cannot digest. And we actually, I think if you're really honest, many of us cannot even digest the, the news that we that we consume and also many of the atrocities, you know, you hear about terror attacks and shooting in schools and all kinds of atrocities. It seems like that we are mentally more informed, but I don't think that we are emotionally and bodily capable of digesting the information that we get. And this leads to like a higher activation. And then if, if somebody anyway is already traumatized, all this information actually creates a much higher pressure which creates higher rates of burnout, higher rates of kind of psychological issues, health issues. So that's the polarization between the innovative capacity that we see in the world and the kind of the trauma struggle, the trauma impulses also travel with high speed around the planet. I think that's something that needs kind of an inner art of living, that in order to live in that time sustainably, and in a good way so that we find ways to digest because if we don't digest if you are not able to feel what we read we actually didn't really read it mm -hmm. because if you are overloaded mentally we are just congested but we are not really global witnesses because yeah. caring yeah. comes when we feel caring doesn't come when we just mentally understand yeah. and i think that's a that's a big question that because I think that creates some kind of disruption or um, some kind and and the technology revolution will create a lot of societal change um, as most probably climate change will do and so I think we really this is the time where we need this kind of inner stability to be willing and able to be part of a change capacity like to to really embody the capacity to change and and I believe that's crucial for our world that we can be participants in the change that is needed in order to, you know, uh, respond to the current challenges. And I think that inner practice or spiritual practice and inner stability, presence, relatedness, like one of the spiritual practices in culture is relation or process awareness. So all of it, I think, are very important capacities that um, make us also creative leaders in, in kind of uncertain times. Yeah. Well, and, and on that note, I mean, because you also have the timeless wisdom training that you do. And I think that this dovetails nicely with what we've been talking about. That's right. Yeah, we call it timeless wisdom because we, we combine in a way the contemplative um, wisdom uh, that is around already, I mean, for thousands of years, and and then um, and then we combine it with integration work. We we look at like individual development and how to integrate the difficulties that we face so that our spiritual practice doesn't become a bypass, that we don't run away from our worldly difficulties, but that we really gain resources and capacities to that our spiritual practice strengthens us to be even more responsible kind of citizens here on this planet. And, um, but also that we are citizens that transcend our current notion of identity, our current notion of what we are identified with and that we open ourselves to kind of a higher creativity or kind of connectedness with everything. And, so yeah, it's a it's a very good package that takes us through the kind of individual development, intimate relationship development, uh, us as a cultural participant, as a as a participant in the world's process, and the spiritual practice. And it's a two year, very intensive dive. I, I have a big team of trained therapists and psychologists that come with me, and it's a something that we run already more than ten years and. Um, 
and it's a very, very intense and deep and transformational program. So I'm very happy with that program. And we have big groups and, um, and uh, kind of a deep process with it. And we did it. Um, I think this is the fifth time that we run this program before it was even three years. And then we reduced it to two years and we are already running the second program in, in the US. We have five programs in Germany. So yeah, it's a, it's a, a very beautiful and also demanding process. Well, with over any, two years. Yeah. With any spiritual, um, education, it does seem like it's always a demanding process. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're right. <laughs> Yeah. And I want to, mm -hmm. I want to add something to what you said, because I think you said something very wise now that also kind of clarifies a little bit, um, kind of the, the face that spirituality gets in the modern world and also in the capitalistically oriented world is like, we, we often see spirit as something that we can consume quickly. And, um, and we expect this kind of fast miraculous changes in our life. Whereas all the really deep wisdom traditions tell us that like to commit to a path is a commitment, like it's a path because it's like we really, in a way, change a lot of our interior uh, environments in order to liberate ourselves and to liberate like our core intelligence. And that, as you said, that this, this is on the one hand demanding and it's on the other hand, it's also like a path, like a good wine that gets better, like the older it gets and that the spiritual path, a serious spiritual path is a commitment. That's something that we walk for the rest of our life or lives. If we want to see it that way. So yeah, that was very important. What you said. Oh, well, thank you. Well, and I know that you have these, um, you have a workshop coming up in California. Um, so that one, I believe, because I was looking, just to see, because you're in the U.S., which doesn't happen very often, and uh, I believe you have a workshop in California coming up for the timeless and um, the timeless training workshop, the timeless wisdom training, um, and you also have an event coming up in New York, Celebrate Life Festival. I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, we did. Like this is the 15th festival that we did, like that we do. Uh, we did 14 of them in, in Germany. Um, this is an event where I think last year we had 1,400 participants. And, um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a stage where I invite also other teachers or speakers in different fields and we, we explore certain topics every year has a different topic. And, um, this year it's the first time in the U S it's at Omega Institute in upstate New York. And, um, it's going to be in August on the 12th till the 17th of August. And it's kind of a, a beautiful atmosphere because it's also for families with kids. It's that we, we have a main stage, we have different workshops. We have, um, like a whole process over, the course of these five days and um, we look at like what does inner and outer fragmentation mean as you said we are, we are in a world where there's a lot of polarization there's a lot of othering there's a lot of fragmentation and and separation and um, and we want to look at how this lives in me how this lives in my relationships that I build how this lives in the culture that I live in and how this might also live in in my relation to to higher spirit. And so we, we are walking ourselves as a group and, uh, through and, and, and have some self exploration, some relational exercises. And we call it festival because during the day we, we do deep work, but in the evenings we have like cultural programs. We have artists come musicians, we have dance parties. We have like, it's a, it's a good mixture of, being able to have fun and, and also being part of a vibrant community of people that have a spiritual practice that are culturally creative, that are leaders in their field or, or do meaningful projects in the world, but also come together in order to get nourished with like-minded people. It's a kind of a lovely community event and it has a deep practice from early morning. So people can choose to participate 
in many different uh, practices, events, talks, keynotes, uh, workshops, and um, yeah, and and see how that relates to their life and and take whatever we learn in these five days into everybody's life at home and apply it and uh, live it. So that's again in a nutshell. And um, but that's and we 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 got. <laughs> Very beautiful feedback in the last years, how like the atmosphere or the energy of that event is kind of very bright. It, it, it's kind of a very uplifting event, even if you look at also some often painful or difficult things. And, um, and it creates a lovely community also for people to meet, to also meet like-minded people. Many projects uh, are being envisioned in such a lab. It's kind of like a cultural laboratory also. And so it's a beautiful event, yeah. Well, I, I think it's a fabulous event, and I'm looking into attending and highly suggest everyone do the same. You know, Thomas, where can people connect with you and be part of your community? Yeah, we have a whole online academy. So there is one, I think the simplest entry gate is uh, either through my website, thomashubel.com. Um, we have this kind of academy that has in-depth programs and um, also like a whole series of online content and online courses that I do on mystical principles for whatever health and healing practitioners like therapists, doctors, nurses. And, um, and then we have, you know, courses on intimate relationship and on, on like the mystical teachings, like the spiritual mystical knowledge. And um, so we have a whole different uh, variety of courses and we do also, we do annual retreats. People can come to the festival if people want to do a deep dive, you know, we, every two years we start a new timeless wisdom training and, um, and I do an annual retreat in, uh, in, in Israel um, over the, over New Year's. So people can also come there. Or simply connect first online and get to know me, um, and then and then see if that resonates for them, and, and then take it deeper. Well, I know you have a lot of videos online, so people can learn more about you and your work, and also visit your website. We'll have the link right here. You know, Thomas, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Yeah, thank you. And maybe one more thing to add is that, I mean, we are definitely open, you know, we, we, are, we are working on this kind of non-profit initiative in many countries on collective trauma. So if anybody is interested, the Pocket Project um, is a very interesting platform for anybody who is interested in that. Yeah. So, yeah, I also thank you, Marianne. This was a lovely conversation. And thank you for inviting me. I, I really appreciate uh, that you that we have this time together. Well, thank you, Thomas. It's been such a joy to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about not only modern day mysticism, but of course, your upcoming event in New York, Celebrate Life Festival. So if you'd like to connect with Thomas and learn more about the event that's coming up, you can visit his website at thomashubel.com. Last name is spelled H-U-E-B-L.com. You'll find information there in regards to the event and, of course, connect with him on all social media. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.